Okay, we are uh, back in session and we have um, skipped items 5.1 through 5.4 uh, because they aren't here today. They're all coming tomorrow morning. And we will go to the item 5.5, the state and federal legislative update with Vice Chancellor Mattoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to uh, talk about three attachments that are included in your uh, board agenda today. Uh, first, I'm going to cover the state policy and advocacy update. Then I'll cover the federal policy and advocacy update. And then I will cover the 2020 proposed legislative principles. So beginning on page 99, the legislature reconvened for the second year of the two-year session, the 1920 legislative session last Monday. Um, included in your analysis, in your um, update here, are a number of two-year bills that our office has been monitoring. The first I wanted to mention is Senate Bill 291, which is Senator Leva's legislation to create a financial aid program dedicated to community college students. As you will recall, uh, last year we successfully moved this to the Assembly um, Higher Education Committee, where Senator Leva and Assemblymember Medina agreed to make their proposals to your bills uh, to allow for the Student Aid Commission to convene a work group to try and work through some of the differences between these proposals. That work group is currently underway. We'll be having our third meeting um, next month. Uh, with the goal of moving a proposal forward to the administration and the legislature. I just wanted to note that last week the Campaign for College Opportunity held a lovely event in the Capitol recognizing a number of legislators for their work. Among those recognized was Senator Leva. In her comments and accepting their recognition, she made a commitment that this continues to be a top priority for her and she looks forward to moving this proposal uh, forward to the governor's office. So I thought I'd relay that back to the board. Um, also on this page, 99, Assembly Bill 302 by Assemblymember Berman. You will recall that that bill would have required community college districts to allow for homeless students to park on college campuses overnight. Uh, the bill was amended in the Senate um, Appropriations Committee with some language that the author was not in support of. He therefore decided to hold the bill and to continue to work on the issue. The bill is still pending and our understanding is that Assemblymember Berman is committed to finding a solution for student homelessness, um, but would not be moving this bill forward in its current form without amendments that uh, he agrees to. Um, Assembly Bill 376 by Assemblymember Stone. Um, we understand that the author plans to move that bill forward. That bill would uh, create provisions surrounding the student loan industry, and I think we're interested in seeing how the governor's budget proposal around um, lending and uh, loan servicing might relate to the language that was included in this bill. Um, on page 100, uh, Assembly Bill 1343, uh, that bill, the author does plan to move the issue forward. This bill would have established a rule around the amount of public dollars that can go to for-profit institutions. The agency responsible for overseeing for-profit colleges, the Bureau for Private Post-Secondary Education, is up for sunset review this year. That means that its entire um, rate, um, implementing statutes will be reviewed through the sunset review process. We will continue to monitor that, and I would imagine that this bill, along with any others focused on for-profit education, will be incorporated into that larger sunset review process. Um, we understand that Assembly Bill 1364 by um, Assemblymember Rubio will not be moving forward. We had expressed opposition to that bill uh, based on concerns that it would reduce our college's ability to have access to clinical placement programs, specifically in the area of nursing. Um, and then last on this list, Assembly Bill 1689 would have authorized additional Proposition 63 dollars to move forward to community colleges and UC and CSU for mental health services. We understand that the bill is not moving forward. However, it was a part of this board's budget priorities. There is still a lot of interest in the legislature, so we will still continue to push for Proposition 63 dollars to be included in the final budget act. The legislature has until February 21st to introduce new bills in this session. There's about 50 additional two-year bills that are pending that we are still trying to determine the author's intent moving forward. Uh, when we come back before you in March, we'll have a full list of new bills moving forward in the 2020 year. Any questions on state legislation? Uh, Vice President Haynes. So I want to go back to AB 302, the Berman bill. And usually when a bill is on hold, in order to get it off of hold, you have the author has to put up like three basic reasons why it's important to do so. 
um, that are, that's compelling. And so there is a there is a, a lot of um, back and forth um, relative to um, the acceptance of amendments in the the last session. And so. Is there any indication from the author that um, the author will be much more flexible, um, or is, or is this a? Uh, I'm going to use the wrong word, so I'll, I'll a, a tactic that um, doesn't move. I, I guess. Are we still going to be? Are, we, are community colleges, um, many of them, still going to be at least um, quietly? In opposition to the bill, one because it's a, it's it's a mandate, and then also there's a number of, of security and safety issues. So, are are some of those kinds of issues going to attempt to be addressed? Um, uh, do you know? I would say that the bill is on the Senate floor, so it was approved out of the Senate Appropriations okay. Committee. So it's on the Senate floor, and the author has selected not to move it in its current form. I would expect that there would need to be negotiations between the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee and the author to work out amendments beyond what was approved in appropriations. Um, I do understand the author is still very much committed to this issue. I would just note that since last year when we had this conversation, we were able to roll out the uh, application process, the request for proposal process for um, the new housing and homelessness dollars that were included in the budget. So I expect that some of the work that will happen under those resources might inform the conversation moving forward. I do expect that if this bill were to continue to maintain a mandate that there would be many community college districts in opposition. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. On to, uh, I'm going to move on to page 101, the federal update. Just a few updates from the time that this um, document was sent to print. Um, the, we expect that, um, so the president did sign uh, the continuing resolution to continue to fund the government through September. Uh, we expect the president's budget proposal to be released on February 10th of this year, next month. That will be following the State of the Union, which will occur on uh, February 4th. Uh, we continue to support the College Affordability Act. Um, we expect that that will move forward off the House floor. Uh, we've provided comments and support to the House committee. Obviously, its fate in the Senate is um, uh, less sure. Um, we are proposing one additional bill for support from this office. Um, Senate Proposal 2225 by Senator Harris would create a grant process under the federal government to fund planning grants and implementation grants for colleges to address food and housing insecurity. Um, this is consistent with a previous House bill that was introduced on this uh, topic, which we also supported. Uh, so we are proposing to support that bill. On um, page 102, I would just note that we included in here an update on the proposed H.R. 1865 to continue to um, fund the government. That bill was signed on, that bill was signed by President Trump on December uh, 20th. It included important increases for community colleges and for higher education, including an increase in the maximum Pell Grant award by $150, um, an increase in the uh, supplemental education opportunity grants that go out to colleges, and then an increase in federal work study. Um, similarly, the Future Act, which was outlined in your, the document, was signed on December 18th. We were also pleased to support that, which ensured uh, ongoing resources for minority-serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities. Uh, the last item I'll lift up is that um, what I had outlined in here in your document was testimony that Secretary DeVos had provided regarding their implementation of uh, borrower defense and uh, loan defaults for students who'd been defrauded, um, namely ITT and Corinthian. Uh, since the time of publication, the House has announced that they are expect this week to vote um, on a Congressional Review Act, which would overturn the Department of Education's rules on borrower defense. We'll continue to monitor and update you as action occurs on the federal front. That's all I was going to mention on the federal side, and I'm happy to take questions. Cargo. I'm just, um, I'm curious because just as an outside observer, seems like the House is passing lots of things and the Senate's kind of not. So is our uncertainty, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, other than judge appointments, uh, I don't know what the Senate's been doing. Uh, is that the uncertainty about what the Senate's doing? Is there really not moving anything through the Senate or is it just that we don't know their 
thoughts or opinions on these things? I think that we can point to the Future Act and uh, the budget uh, increases that really prioritize some of our needs in the community college system as areas where the Senate and House were able to come together and reach compromise and move an issue forward. Uh, the other items I've lifted up, we just don't know yet the fate, but we expect and hope that communications and negotiations are happening between the two houses. Nicely said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Member Hall? How is uh, Senator Harris's Bill 2225 different from the um, Educational Services and Support Division that we talked about this morning, which is about money to study food insecurity? The money that was discussed this morning in the contracting grants is $500,000 to support really research into what colleges can do to address food insecurity among community college students. This would provide, and that's statewide research that's funded in the state budget. This is federal funding right. that could provide grants directly to colleges, not necessarily through our Board of Governors, but directly to colleges to support planning uh, and then implementation of uh, programs and services. Uh, I think the two can very much be complementary, and I think we would hope that the research that comes out of that $500,000 would help inform the types of programs that colleges would choose to invest in with these new resources. Yeah, uh, Member Salazar. Um, hi, Laura, how are you? Um, as it relates to the provisions to further simplify the FAFSA, have we given, have we begun, because I, I realize that it's relatively new, um, what the implications of that are, uh, specifically towards the I Can Afford College campaign and other outreach uh, as it relates to FAFSA completion? Our office has traditionally supported the efforts to simplify the FAFSA. With the Future Act and the uh, new legislation that will um, reduce the number of questions required, we're still in the process of review and we'll work very closely with the financial aid folks on our team to make sure they understand the simplification and can communicate it clearly to students. Cool. Okay, Member uh, Fitzgerald. So I know that um, you know we we uh, sponsored uh, SB two nine one by Senator Labo. Can you just talk a little bit to the you know we're aware that um, Assembly Member Medina and Labo are working on uh, kind of a joint solution uh, with thirteen fourteen SB two nine one, trying to find a common ground there. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about how that might look with sponsoring SB two nine one and where that could go from our perspective? So the two bills address the problem. Uh, quite differently. Senate Bill 291 essentially replicates um, a financial aid program like that that happens for University of California students. Um, it would take all of the existing aid that's available to a student and package that and then add a new grant on top of it to meet their total cost of attendance needs. That's kind of how um, University of California does that right now under blue and gold. Um, Assembly Bill 1314 wants to revitalize the entire Cal Grant program. So they would take the existing three different grant programs, the entitlement and the competitive, and sort of consolidate that um, so that every student, regardless of which institution they attend, could be eligible for something that covers their total cost of attendance. Our, our uh, questions around Assembly Bill 1314 have focused on the fact that it continues to um, look mostly at tuition. Right, the first guarantee would be tuition payments for students. In our system, tuition is covered by the Promise Grant, formerly the Bog Fee Waiver. And so to ensure that our students are receiving adequate resources, the real question becomes, what is that non-tuition grant amount? Who's gonna be eligible for it and how much will it be? And so that's really been the, um, uh, board members Eric Goza and I sit on the work group and that's really been our focus is on the non-tuition cost, particularly for non-traditional students in the community college system. We are evaluating a proposal that would phase in new resources that appears to focus new resources largely on the lowest income students across the systems. Uh, we're looking at the financial um, implications of that and we're continuing to discuss with the Student Aid Commission and the other members of the work group. And, and let's assume that there's a bill, uh, there's kind of a solution reached in that work group. Do we continue to you know, support SB 291 and then decide if we support the new bill, or how does that look? Assemblymember McCarty, Medina, and Senator Leva requested this work group. They sent a letter requesting the creation of this work group. My expectation is the results of the work group would go back to the members, and in conversations with the members, 
we would determine what their goals are around their legislation. There's a variety of ways this could play out. You could take a new proposal and put some of it in thir Assembly Bill 1314 and some of it in Senate Bill 291 and move forward together. Our position would be informed by coming back to this board with the outcome of the work group and seeking your feedback before we took a position. Perfect. Thank you. And, and the reason I ask is because, you know, SB 291 is probably the most important bill for students. I mean, financial aid reform is extremely essential for basic needs and, and just everything, especially, you know, in, in Stockton where I'm from. So um, just wanted to thank you for that. Okay. Moving on to uh, alleged principles. You'll recall that last year the Board of Governors revised Standing Order 317, which directs the Chancellor and authorizes the Chancellor to take positions on pending legislation. During the conversation about the revisions to um, um, the uh, three, uh, Standing Order 317, Questions were raised about what guides the Chancellor's Office staff, my division, in determining which bills to take positions on where to focus our priorities. So in response to that conversation, I agreed to bring back um, an updated legislative principles. This document, which is currently in draft form, is intended to give you information about what guides my division in how to review legislation. Prior to taking positions on any bill, my division will conduct an analysis, consult with st system stakeholders, consult with internal chancellor's office divisions, we'll bring an analysis to consultation council, and then we bring a bill, the proposed position to this board for your input before we take a position. This document is really just intended to give you information about how we review bills before they come to you. And so what you see here are six overarching principles that focus on ensuring legislation is consistent with the vision for success, ensuring that to the maximum degree possible we support local control, that when we do engage in legislation, it's on legislation that is statewide in nature, where the justification for state level intervention is compelling, and where data shows that the proposed solution is actually a solution to the problem at hand. Uh, we continue to advocate for maximizing resources available to colleges within and outside of Proposition 98. We focus on ensuring this office is adequately funded to do the work of the chancellor's office and of our system. And we advocate to ensure that community colleges are adequately represented on any statewide boards and commissions. So those are the overarching principles. Following that, you'll see a legislative issue matrix. This list was developed based on prior legislative positions, the budget and legislative request, the vision for, and the vision for success. This document is intended to give you a sense of what guides us when we bring a position before you. But in each bill that we bring before you, you would have the opportunity on that specific bill to look at the language of the bill, the requirements of the bill, and suggest alternative positions. This document is not binding in any form in that way. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pause, and I'm happy to take questions about the principles themselves or about the outlined summary positions in the matrix. Uh, Member Shaw. Uh, Jeff. Jeff. No, I, <clears throat> pardon me, I just want to uh, compliment her on, on her work. She has a really multifaceted job <laughs> where she has to come up with the ideas and convince people uh, that they're right and then deal with so many different uh, egos and personalities. And so I always want to co compliment Laura in terms of what she does. Thank you. Member Baum. I also wanted to express my appreciation. This is a, actually an outstanding document. Not actually, it is an outstanding document that uh, really articulates our priorities. And I, I presume it came out of what the board's direction has been in, in giving a framework. So one, that said, there's one piece that uh, I wanted to ask about too, because I've raised this in the, in, in the past. Where would a, an, a focus on trying to reform the system in that the board can't and the the chancellor's office would be able to have a structural change in order to uh, carry out the responsibilities that the state gives it with respect to contracts major initiatives funding uh, for ma uh, major priorities that are statewide and and so that we can make that a stronger system instead of having to lose efficiencies by farming them out to fiscal agents uh, outside the chancellor's office. I would 
say that our budget and legislative request that this, board, this body votes on each September is where we outline the resources necessary to support our system. The next item we will discuss is the governor's budget and included in there you will see uh, support for something we submitted back in September, a system of support, which would allow us to use our set-asides um, more strategically to support the work of this office and the work of the system. Uh, so I would say that the budget and legislative request outlines what we felt we needed in terms of staff position and funding uh, uh, available to the system. Uh, I think that those needs are carried out in all of the legislation we take positions on. We provide cost estimates and we try and inform the legislature and the governor's office that when a new program comes with, within a legislative proposal, new resources are necessary. Right, but then what's been happening, and we've talked about this over the years, that when a new program comes through, the chancellor's office is charged with doing it, and then to actually carry it out, the chancellor's office has to subcontract that to a third party, uh, most oftentimes a local district. And I've been told that it takes it will take legislative action to actually fix that uh, inefficiency in the structure. Um, I would yeah. say that the um, we can hire positions based on the positions that are authorized in the annual budget act. And so, there is an opportunity for us to have increased positions uh, approved in the Budget Act, which would allow us to have more capacity to do some of that work. If you're talking about changing the structure of this agency away from um, a state agency, um, more to an independent entity, I think that would require a legislative proposal. Mm -hmm. It's just something I wanted to put on the table uh, for consideration. I'm sorry, before you, before you speak, just to clarify, you're not talking about changing the structure, you're just talking about not having to go through a community college district right. to spend state money. If the state creates an initiative, that's a constitutional provision. It's more than legislative. Yeah, Proposition 98. Yeah, right. that's what you're yeah. talking about. Right. It's how do we uh, how do we address something like that? And Is what's it? your answer? <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, I, I can't help but weigh in a little bit. Uh, um, <laughs> well, so there's, there's a couple of things I think the, the Board of Governors could consider. One is certainly your own advocacy with your appointing authority, which is the governor of the state of California, and raising this issue uh, from the point of view of, um, you know, your appointment to the Board of Governors and your experience in the Board of Governors and informing the governor of the challenges that you see as members of the board. Um, I think that's certainly something that you, you could do without any, any other, um, without any legislative intervention. But as Member Costa pointed out, this is a constitutional issue, but it's also a, um, whether it be a case law issue or an issue of interpretation of Prop 98. And I think um, there it has been, will be debate about what is the line, the bright line of Prop 98. I think the Department of Finance um, has had a interpretation of what that bright line is. We have sometimes a more nuanced interpretation. Um, uh, so that, that is where um, there could be some movement. I think our general counsel has looked at that bright line and we could invite him some point to give his opinion about that bright line, but uh, but that is a it, it is a it's, it's a difficult situation because we are a state agency, uh, and so uh, that determination may or may not be made by us. Right. So what what we're saying is that it's not necessarily in the legislative matrix; it's in a different uh, arena than that. I was just uh, the board reserves the right to. Uh, direct the chancellor's office staff to weigh in on any issue it feels um, is necessary, even if it's not in this matrix. Thank you. Um, so in the uh, the uh, kind of uh, 
six item uh, legislative principles, I, I noticed that uh, there's two parts that uh, struck my attention and, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, the first part is, um, it says the Board of Governors, uh, we have to maintain neutrality on legislation affecting the Board of Governors composition and then relating to that um, on the local governing boards, the same neutrality on the composition. And the reason that uh, that stuck out to me is I know that the there's a huge focus, a huge movement uh, statewide right now from students uh, to fight for uh, for on the local governing boards, you know, full voting rights for student trustees, um, and then there's also a movement within the student senate to fight for uh, first year uh, voting rights, uh, kind of in the the AB five one four, but for the California community colleges for the board of governors member, and um, I know that the uh, there was not a neutral stance on five one four in the CSU trustee board. Um, and I worry that if there is a movement that gains traction uh, from students um, and when the time is right for us to step up and, and actually fight for our students as, as uh, Board of Governors members, that this will prohibit us from doing so. Can you speak to that? This board has long had a principle that it would support local control and local determination around board local board functions. And so for us, this was consistent in terms of uh, local student trustee voting rights. This position was consistent with the historic position of this board. In terms of the voting rights of the student member on this body, our um, recommendation was simply that this body is appointed by the governor. Uh, the governor has the authority to determine who um, this body is made up of. Um, uh, and that it would be um, appropriate for the governor and the legislature to continue to make those determinations. This, however, would not preclude board members in your individual capacity to advocate one way or another on, position, on uh, policies that move forward. Thank you. I have a question in a similar vein. On, on the Board of Governors uh, maintaining neutrality on, on legislation affecting the BOG composition, appointments, confirmation, and so forth, uh, you know, I think I kind of get it, but on the other hand, who knows more about it than we do? And so, just uh, just curious, to give the your rationale for why we should stay away from that. It really goes um, back to that the ultimately the legislature and the governor make decisions around the composition of this board, um, and that we would continue to respect their authority to do so. That if um, the legislature and the governor wanted to add ex officio members or change the voting requirements of this board, it would be within their jurisdiction. We obviously could uh, give feedback and recommendations without taking formal positions, uh, if so desired. Member but Costa. The entire thing is within their jurisdiction. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of splitting hairs without a difference. <laughs> You know, I mean, we either are going to wade into the political process and um, make, you know, position statements or we're not. Um, you know, the entirety of uh, this board and everything that we oversee as well as all lo local districts are under the purview of both the legislature and the governor. So you're saying that you don't necessarily I, You know, I, I don't know that I have a strong feeling about it. I, I think I have a little bit of... Um, um, I hear what uh, Colm is saying, though, about the student trustees. Um, and, you know, we could certainly make a distinction that any policy that comes forward um, that would increase representation by students um, on our impacted local boards or the structure of BOG, I would be okay with. Um, as far as the composition of us as a whole, I don't really have strong feelings on it. I'm just being kind of debatey, I guess, by saying, you know, <laughs> that's not really the, yeah. the line of, uh, uh, of distinction here because we're weighing in on everything. So, you know, our composition or the law, you know. We'll, we'll go from you to the, to the debate coach yourself. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I got, I got the <laughs> counter I, I would just say this. I do think it's very important, um, even on a local issue, like whether a student should be voting on as a trustee or not, uh, is a local issue to, to solve. I, I really believe that if we say, well, we believe in that, right? It's, it's student advocacy, so that's great. But then what happens when it's another local issue, you know? So I think that it's difficult to make these distinctions that we'll do it in the case of students, but not in case other cases. So I think taking a neutral position and letting local boards make those decisions for themselves is important. And you do have statewide advocacy groups. We have statewide advocacy groups that can intervene and, and make the point on our behalf. 
And then as far as the composition of this board, suppose that uh, the majority of this board decides they don't want faculty on this anymore, or they don't want students on it anymore, or, you know, we don't want outside members on it anymore, or whatever that might look like. I think that that's better fought in the legislature with people who do that. I think that this board is better in a neutral position. And I know that we're not doing anything with this, but the debate coach and me just wanted, felt like I needed to say that. <laughs> No, and not. see, that's why we recommend staying neutral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hadn't even thought of keeping faculty off the bug. I mean, that was... <laughs> <laughs> Might be the smartest movie ever made. <laughs> Is John still here? <laughs> yeah, <he's> here. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I completely agree with you on the, uh, on the local... Um, on the local districts, I mean, I think that's that's a snake pit for us to muck around in. But you know, if it affects the bog, I mean, I I don't know, I I could go either way. But uh, but you know, you know, it, it seems like we shouldn't um, muzzle ourselves if if the, the board unanimously feels you know or strongly feels that you know some bill is making a big mistake with the. Composition. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of open-minded about it. I, I hate to kind of take it off the table as a policy, but just would curious what others think. Well, you may get that opportunity sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, more I talk there about is it. a proposal <laughs> to add members to the Board of Governors. Oh. Um, cool. So, <laughs> well, we don't know yet. Um, we don't know if, uh, but there is discussion about um, at least adding the Lieutenant Governor to the Board of Governors. So. Um, but again, you know, these are ex-official positions. Um, the makeup of the board may change if it's going to reflect the same ex-officials as the other two boards. Uh, we need a bigger dais, <laughs> uh, and uh, we need more TV time. But um, but uh, so I, I I think that's that's it's a question for you all. You know, how much do you want to weigh in on those issues that are going to be before the legislature? Um, I certainly think you you should. Have a point of view. The question is, is a, a formal position the best way to express that point of view? Yeah. Uh, well, I think a big problem, at least for the student members, is you, you know we can advocate all we want, but um, it's, it gives so much more power when you uh, you attach your title as a board of governors member and you advocate as a board of governors member and i i definitely agree that you know local control is important so also see that um when talking about the local issues maintaining neutrality makes more sense but when we're talking about the composition of the board of governors i have to agree with president epstein's uh, point earlier that i think we are the best body to to uh, talk about that and um, it, it would, in my opinion, it would be almost foolish to muzzle ourselves and, um, and not weigh in and take a formal stance. Um, be, and if we can't speak to that, then we're speaking as individuals and many people won't listen, at least specifically to the students. Uh, Member Rawlings. Thank you. Uh, so in this, particular topic, I would say uh, the, the legislative principles aren't necessarily written completely in stone. I think these are really what the we're directing the Chancellor's Office. If they're in alignment with the legislative principles, they can go ahead and move forward on it. But I think as we do have issues uh, potentially where the, the makeup of this body or there are other issues that maybe are particularly concerning to this board, uh, that at that point, this board could assert itself and uh, decide to take a position on it. So. Uh, I think the legislative principles as they are are probably okay, but that uh, as these things come up that uh, we just make sure that we're notified when we have things that maybe we have a principle on but might be a concern for us. And my uh, division will continue to produce the legislative matrix and summary documents so that you know all bills that have been introduced that relate to our colleges and our students. I would just argue that uh, on issues of, of board composition, I would adv I would agree with the uh, stance of neutrality that if, if we have individual as individuals have a point of view to share, we could share that. But uh, as I, I want it to be seen that every decision that we make with respect to legislative policy 
is done without ourselves personally uh, investing what, what our desire is, but what we uh, believe is, as a board. And, and I think by maintaining neutrality as to the composition and, and um, other aspects of the Board of Governors uh, would help that. So I, I, I would agree with um, Member Baum. Um, and with regard to um, our 115 um, uh, colleges and our 74 districts, 73, I'm adding too many, um, our 73 districts, in, in statute and in law, there is local control. Um, and while we may want, there are areas in which there are definitely efficiencies, but those are locally elected members and, um, and, and a, as a body across the state, I, I, what I would say is we hold that really as one of the cornerstones. Um, and we're always cognizant of um, when, we make, when we make decisions, that, and not all do it well, we, we've got board members who don't adhere um, we may have different opinions on any number of policy issues, but once that vote is taken, then we as a board will follow through in a single voice. And that, I think that, um, and I've been on the other side of not always agreeing with my colleagues on, the, on, on my board, but I do agree with that we really do have to have a single voice when we, when we move forward on issues. Um, and so, I, I, but I do think that there are, and if we use students as an example of really trying to argue that when they are recognized as, as board members and that there is some type of um, equity and democracy that happens, that really has to happen at a local level. And obviously state entities can be supportive of that and can do advocacy and, and, and there are pressure points. Um, and, but that's how we are supposed to be doing those kinds of things. Um, to the extent that we get more and more students who will show up and voice their concerns at our board meetings, the, the, the better it is for, for board members to hear what the issues are and that, that students are really taking an interest and they're advocating on their own behalf. OK. I think, uh... We'll soldier on to, uh, that's the end of this item. Um, no public comment. So now we're gonna do the update on the release of the governor's budget. And you changed chairs for that. <laughs> you moved to the, uh, <laughs> I thought maybe you were moving to the right when the budget came up. <laughs> Okay, just give it a second for our PowerPoint to come up. Great, thank you, um, board members. I'm happy to keep this chair warm until my <laughs> colleague, Lizette Neverett, joins us. Uh, I want to thank Assistant Vice Chancellor Parmley for uh, co-presenting. Um, so on Friday, the governor released his January budget proposal for the second year in a row. We partnered with the chief business officers, uh, college administrators, and the league to produce a factual document summarizing the governor's January budget. Uh, that's been handed out to you. Uh, major themes in the governor's budget include uh, addressing aff the affordability crisis, investments in health care and housing. In terms of health care, the governor proposes to revamp Medi-Cal, uh, to increase preventative health services, uh, to boost assistance for homeless individuals, and to improve mental health care. Uh, the proposal on health care would allow undocumented persons over the age of 65 to enroll in Medi-Cal. Um, undocumented children and young adults already qualify. And it would also cut prescription drug costs uh, by proposing to create a single purchasing market in California um, and a state-owned generic drug label. In terms of housing, the proposal provides $750 million to create the California Access to Housing and Services Fund. Uh, this would be distributed to local providers to provide emergency rental assistance, to build housing, and to improve uh, shelters. 
State trailers and tents uh, for shelters uh, would also be included, as well as uh, using state, potentially using state lands for temporary shelters. There's also some uh, significant proposals in the area of education, including increasing and improving access to early learning and care. Uh, the proposal would create a new department of early childhood development uh, and provide additional preschool slots. Uh, the proposal would put $1.2 billion into increases in the K-12 local control funding formula, $900 million uh, for educator recruitment and training, and $900 million for special education. For UC and CSU, the budget would provide a 5% increase with the expectation that those resources would be used to expand access uh, and to continue efforts to graduate more students, reduce time to degree, and close achievement gaps. Um, there's also a proposal to invest significant resources into the Central Valley, um, including $40 million for UC Riverside and UC San Francisco um, medical schools and $17 million for Fresno K-16 Collaborative. Specific to the K-14 budget, uh, Proposition 98 provides a minimum guarantee for schools and community college funding. Uh, the formulas determine the total funding. Uh, the governor and the legislature determine the allocations within that formula. In determining the Proposition 98 requirements, uh, the Department of Finance estimates the minimum guarantee, and the estimates cover the prior year, the current year, and the budget year, as you see in this slide. This is adjusted periodically with a settle-up required if funding is below the Proposition 98 guarantee level. What you see here is that estimates for the minimum guarantee for 1819 and 1920 have changed slightly compared to the projections when the 1920 budget was enacted in June of last year. Uh, these increases can occur if school enrollment, economic growth, or state revenues turn out to be different than we initially estimated. Uh, the revised estimate for, for 1819 is higher than it was projected in June. As a result, the state's required to make a settle-up payment to fully fund the guarantee. Um, the settle-up payment for 1819 affects K-12 only, uh, and the community college share of Proposition 98 remains above that traditional share. In addition, uh, the revised estimate for 1920 is higher than was projected in June. The governor's budget adjusts funding to match the revised guarantee in 1920. Uh, for community colleges, total Proposition 98 funding is at or above the 10.93 traditional split. Uh, for the budget year, there is an error in the information shared that resulted in this calculation being 10.92%. We understand from the administration that that error will be corrected before the budget is enacted to ensure that community colleges receive their share of 10.93%. My turn. Um, Francis Parmalee, Assistant Vice Chancellor of um, um, College Finance and Facilities Planning. Um, some major decisions that were made was there was no changes to the student-centered funding formula at this time. Uh, the administration fully supports, though, the um, addition of the new metric um, uh, recommended by the um, Formulas Oversight Committee in which the first-generation college students um, be incorporated in future dates. Um, we have gotten direction from the administration that they expect that the chancellor's office collect uh, good data in order to provide um, good uh, projections in future years. Uh, a minimum of two years of data would most likely be needed for finance to produce some reliable projections. Another addition is that growth and uh, COLA was provided in this um, proposal. It included 0.5 percent growth in access and a 2.29 COLA for apportionments and select categorical programs, to name a few. Uh, it was DSPS and EOPS and the mandates program. Um, this coming uh, February, our, our unit will be issuing preliminary draft rates. Um, the, the, 19, the 2019 Budget Act tasked the Chancellor's Office with determining the formula's final 2019-20 um, funding rates based on the TCR that was provided to us by the Department of Finance. Uh, the chancellors, we hope to anticipate and calculate those rates by mid-February and share that with the field. Um, the reason for the delay is that we are, at this point, uh, still receiving some enrollment data and student outcomes. We have a deadline of January 15th, and, we, and that information is needed in order to set uh, these preliminary rates. Uh, following the submission of the district's second enrollment reports that are due in April, those rates would, will again be adjusted um, um, to um, prior to the budget enactment. 
I wanted to add that there was also some additional funding in regards to deferred maintenance and instructional materials. Uh, we received a total of uh, uh, 17.2. That's a combination of various components. There's 8.1 million of 1920 funds, uh, 1 1.5 million of reappropriation, and a, another 7.6 million in one-time funds in this current um, budget proposal. In the area of college affordability, the governor's proposal includes 10 million uh, for additional resources to support the creation of zero textbook cost pathways um, aligned to guided pathways. This is consistent with the request that was included in this board's request back in September. Um, in addition, the governor's budget proposes $5 million in grants. Um, I'm sorry, the, this builds on the $5 million proposal provided in 2016, which resulted in a number of zero textbook cost pathways. Um, in the area of financial aid reform, the administration has did not include any major proposals, but indicated it will be reviewing the forthcoming work group report um, and using that to uh, inform any new investments. Uh, we will continue to advocate for those new investments to be included in legislative actions and hopefully in the May revise. Um, the, there was $5 million provided in the January budget proposal to the Student Aid Commission to uh, put together outreach and information on reducing student loan debt. Um, it appears that the proposal intends to uh, capitalize on existing federal loan repayment options that are available under current federal law, as well as uh, provide additional information and outreach to students. In the area of faculty staff support, uh, the proposed budget includes 15 million one time to create and implement on a pilot basis, a fellowship for current and recent graduate students. Uh, the purpose of this fellowship program, as you heard earlier, is to improve faculty diversity at community colleges uh, through recruitment and mentorship. <coughs> There's also 10 million one time for part-time faculty office hours that was provided. In the area of supporting student needs, the governor has proposed uh, 27.8 million ongoing and 20.4 one time um, to fund apprenticeship hours. Uh, it would, the proposal would also double the amount of money available in the California Apprenticeship Initiative. Currently that uh, amount is 15 million, it would double to 30 million. Um, and then the proposal would actually, um, uh, it proposes to adopt a, pro a program that came forward to this board last year uh, for 20 million one time to expand access to work-based learning opportunities um, aligned to the Guided Pathways framework. This was a proposal that was included in the Board of Governors' um, 1920 budget and legislative request uh, that has now been introduced in the Governor's January proposal. In the area of supporting our undocumented students, the governor's proposal would provide 5.8 million in ongoing funds to support Dreamer resource liaisons at all campuses. You may recall that Assembly Bill 1645 required all colleges to have a Dream resource liaison. Unfortunately, the bill itself didn't have any additional funding associated with it. Our understanding is that these resources are uh, intended to fund the requirements created by Assembly Bill 1645. The proposal also would uh, allocate 10 million ongoing for legal service providers uh, to provide legal services to undocumented students, faculty, staff um, on community college campuses. Um, two years ago, we were provided $10 million one time uh, that went through the chancellor's office to the Department of Social Services. Those resources are now being rolled out into the field. About half of the colleges that sought to be host campuses were able to be legal services host campuses with that initial 10 million one time. Um, these ongoing resources would support and expand those services. Uh, and then finally, in terms of additional proposals, uh, the proposal would include 11.4 million ongoing to fund food pantry uh, programs at community colleges, and then 5 million um, ongoing to fund instructional materials for dual enrollment students. Before we leave this slide, um, just the 20 million in one time to access, could you explain that? I, I'm not really sure what that is. The idea is to create additional apprenticeship or work-based learning models aligned to guided pathways um, uh, programs. And so uh, the, we so know that's, that- that's all part of the still apprenticeship program? Yes, okay. yes. But it would okay. be expanded beyond those traditional fields in which you see apprenticeship. Right. Okay, got it. Thanks. Just building off the earlier discussion about the new um, CCC system support program, um, the governor proposes uh, shifting uh, $125 million 
in funding um, from existing categorical set-asides and statewide programs to this new program. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, currently the state funds several statewide activities through direct local assistant appropriations or through set-aside in various categorical programs. Uh, these funds are administered through contracts and grants and uh, between the Board of Governors and select uh, community colleges districts. Uh, those districts could use a percentage of their set-asides for their own administrative costs associated with those. And in addition to that, the Chancellor's Office also uh, administers several um, programs for statewide purposes, such as IEPI. So because these statewide programs are budgeted all separately, they're not always well aligned with each other or with the vision for success. So the governor proposes addressing this uh, concern by establishing this new program. Specifically, the new program would absorb all or a portion of existing budgetary set-asides for administrative and statewide activities. Uh, some of the programs that we would do that for is for um, the Student Equity and Achievement Program, KFEES, and Strong Workforce Program. Uh, the new program would also absorb all or a portion of existing funds for the, um, for like I mentioned, IEPI, uh, integrated technology, transfer uh, education and articulation, uh, expanding the delivery of courses through technology and other statewide media um, campaigns. Uh, there's pending trailer bill language that would require the Board of Governors to annually adopt a, a budget for this new program and report on those expenditures uh, for the prior fiscal year. Uh, many of these statewide programs are currently still in place, so we would under, do, uh, undergo a review for possible improvements on their existing contracts um, until that time, until they expire. The proposal also adds uh, $27.6 million in bond funds for 26, 24 new projects. Um, Currently, there was one project that was denied. It was Yuba. Unfortunately, the, um, the joint analysis that you have in your hand does indicate it as being funded. It's being corrected, and you should receive a new version uh, later today. Uh, we are working with Yuba and the Department of Finance on, in order to try to advocate um, to better understand, uh, give them a better understanding of that it should be funded uh, in, the spring, uh, in the spring cycle. In the area of state operations, um, the budget like uh, provides 166,000 ongoing uh, to fund a position in our accounting office. In addition, um, this doesn't look right. I apologize. This looks. This is last year's proposal. I'm sorry. Um, um, we have 166,000 and ongoing uh, for a new position in accounting, and also 700,000. Um, to contract out in support um, the cost of convening a work group of student athlete compensation in the community colleges as required by Senate Bill 206. We are at the very beginning of the budget process. Um, if February through April budget subcommittee hearings will occur in May, the governor will release his May revise. The legislature has until June 15 to act, and implementation of the um, new budget year begins on July 1st. In terms of next steps, our office will be releasing a more detailed analysis in mid-February, um, which will include the projected rates for the student-centered funding formula, as well as any additional information we are able to obtain from proposed budget trailer bills. Uh, we'll release information as it becomes available. Uh, with that, we will stop and take any questions. Um, Member Shaw. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you help me to understand what the major theme is or what is the major agenda? What's the, what's the government's major agenda for community colleges? Because I see a lot of sort of incremental things, but I don't, what's the major thing? The language in the eight pages focused on continuing implementation of the student-centered funding formula. So I would read that to mean um, an investment in the funding formula and the incentives that that funding formula creates, as well as wanting the chancellor's office to collect the data and conduct the analysis necessary to support further implementation. Thank you. If I could add, I think another theme in the governor's budget which affects us is uh, they announced a reorganization of the Department of Labor and Workforce. 
Um, and so that coupled with the increased apprenticeships, there is going to be a move over the next year or two to continue to realign um, the state's workforce resources. Um, and so I think you'll see more and more of that as time goes on. Thanks. Okay, uh, Member Baum. Just a, a couple questions. You mentioned growth. How much is in the budget for projected growth? So it's 0.5%. And are we actually... 31.9 million. And are we actually projecting growth in enrollment for the system? Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering about that. And as I look at the slide, some no. districts, yeah, some districts are growing. Yeah, so it's not consistent. So at this time, we're just uh, finishing up our uh, first apportionment. So we'll be having better data uh, come P1. Um, we'll finalize that next where month. Where in the system, where, and again, we don't have to answer this, sir, but where in the state are we seeing growth? Because I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of districts that are worried about meeting the growth uh, targets as well. Um, but that we can go into that later. The question I have on uh, slide nine, does that get to some of the issues I was talking about earlier when it says that uh, the, the system support, the government, governors uh, recognizes that our structure lacks efficiency, consistency, and alignment, and it creates a new program to provide coordinated support. Is, is that something that could be a much more effective way for the, the system to administer and carry out the priorities given by the governor and the legislature? That is the intent behind this proposal, is to take these small set-aside funds that are currently um, operated by different divisions uh, to consolidate them so that we can use them more effectively. It would still operate in compliance with the requirements of Proposition 98. Sure. At least to me, it's a, it seems like a move in the right direction. But would it? Okay, um, but would it no, uh, I'm sorry. But would it still be addressing the initiatives that were intended? It does not change requirements around statewide support under each of the programs. So, for example, we are required to conduct a series of statewide supports under the Strong Workforce programs. We would continue to do that. What it would allow us to do is think about the statewide supports we provide under Strong Workforce and those we provide under Guided Pathways and those we provide in our dual enrollment programs. And what are the common threads among there? And can we use those resources um, more consistently to support those programs across the divisions? Number Perigo. So I was recently talking to one of my alum, and uh, he sent me this little note that said, debate shaped my life and my professional career, and by debate, I mean you. And I'm not sharing that because I'm looking for some kind of personal accolades for my ability to teach, because there's nothing unique about that. Uh, every faculty member in this state has a million little notes like that. Um, and so when I look at the faculty and staff support that's being um, you know, rec or supported by the governor's office. Um, it's like with very heavy heart that I sit here year after year, and, and I think this, and, and for the three people who are watching us on TV right now, I just really <laughs> want to say that imagine you go to your work, your place of work, and nearly half of your employees are temporary. That's what you're asking us to do, is work with nearly half of our staff is temporary faculty is part-time um, they rotate in and out of our organizations and to have a student like that requires a relationship that can be built with that student and full-time faculty understand how curriculum works and how uh, programs are put together and when i look at the vision for success and i look at all the things that are trying to be accomplished uh, even with the funding formula, you know, I just want to say you can fix that by supporting full-time faculty members. And although I'm very happy to see office hours, our, our district's done office hours for part-timer for many years, and that does help tremendously. But that's not going to get us anywhere, ultimately. So do we know, now that I'm done with my three-minute diatribe, where is the governor on faculty hiring? Do we know, do we have a sense of, yeah, we think it's important, but we don't have the money to fund it? I mean, is it the generic line or where are we on moving forward? I mean, we've, I think we've put together even 
this piece where we're working on uh, faculty diversity, uh, you know, great. So we have a mentorship program, but we're not hiring anybody. So yay for us, you know, like we can't diversify if we're not hiring. And so I really just want to understand if, if we have a sense of if the governor's moving towards more full-time faculty, if we're going to be doing hiring, um, or if we're just kind of going to maintain status quo for a while. I wouldn't want to speak for the governor. <laughs> I would say that the inclusion of the $15 million for the pilot program and the $10 million for office hours shows support of faculty. Traditionally, the legislature has fought to include resources for full-time faculty hiring and part-time faculty support in the budget process. Uh, we will take the board's request, which was adopted back in September, that included those items, and use that to inform our advocacy in the legislature, and we hope in May um, and when the budget is adopted in June, we will see additional resources for those purposes. I think that's an uh, excellent uh, answer. I would add, I mean, the governor certainly supports um, the work that we do in the California Community Colleges. I think the challenge is always, uh, particularly in the last few budget years, allocating one-time resources versus ongoing resources. And I think the former Deputy Director of Finance understands how that works. Um, uh, and it's our job to work with the legislature now to increase the ongoing funding. And I think working with our colleagues, with all the faculty associations, we will bring that forward. Now, I, I will say, the budget provides resources to hire faculty. Let me be clear about that. What we're asking for is resources above and beyond uh, what we normally get to hire more faculty, but there is every expectation that if a district has um, uh, you know, the resources available to it, that it should be looking at its um, uh, uh, full-time faculty to part-time faculty ratios and making the decisions in the best interest of its students. Uh, so by no means are we saying that, um, that, that districts cannot use the existing resources allocated to hire more faculty. Those are uh, certainly decisions that we hope are, are being made in the best interest of students. But I can assure you, uh, Member Perigo, that we will join with our colleagues uh, and uh, advocate for more resources in the legislature. Member Hall. So j just to follow up on that, does that does this one-time budget item mean that for one year there's $10 million extra dollars and then the following year it's gone? And then secondly, is there money set aside for the full-time faculty, or is it, ju is it limited just to the part-time faculty? One-time dollars in the budget means that it's proposing dollars only for the proposed budget. Um, the legislature and the governor would have the opportunity to put new resources in next year's budget proposal, as they have in the past, um, on a number of fronts. There are ongoing resources currently provided um, for full-time faculty. Do we have um, that was provided in a previous budget, and I would have to look and get you the number. And that's the area of uh, health care and uh, compensation for part-time. Member Aguinaldo. So I am trying my darndest not to skip ahead to, to item 5.8, but I have to reference it. Um, the 15 million in 5.8, it looks like the 15 million on slide 7, so we're good with that, but it doesn't look like anything else was provided and that concerns me by itself but the fact that we also didn't get additional support for the chancellor's office as reflected on slide 12 is also insanely disappointing um is my disappointment warranted <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna say no yeah. it's just the beginning That's i mean right. exactly they don't even have all the revenues yet may yeah. revise is the real deal all right, I will hold my <laughs> tissues in abeyance. There you go. Okay. Okay. All right, Costa, you put yourself out there in front. If it doesn't show up after the May revise, I'm blaming Costa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say your proposal would get funded. I just said you can't be disappointed quite yet. Yeah, I can't be blamed anymore. Okay, I think we have a few public comments. 
Tom, can I ask a question while we wait, which is what do you think are the legislative budget priorities so far? You kind of referenced a little bit, um, you know, obviously so we go through the subcommittee, but if you had to um, hazard a guess kind of to Hildy's question about faculty diversity, what do you think would you forecast are the issues? The issues that have largely come our way uh, so far in the legislative year have been around mental health services for students. So if I had to project, I would say opportunities in Prop 63 resources, um, obviously ongoing support from the legislature for faculty. There's always support around faculty diversity and full-time faculty. Um, incarcerated students, uh, serving incarcerated students has been an issue that's really come to the forefront and then a focus on financial aid reform. Uh, those have been the things that I would say have been legislative interest so far. And if I could just add, um, um, mental health started off as a one-time $5 million um, um, uh, revenue for, for colleges. Um, the advocacy that, that got that $5 million came from the board and from those in the district. Um, and that advocacy continues, and that's the reason why we now have money that's ongoing. So uh, there are a number of those things that start as one time, um, and there's advocacy for them, and they end up being in the budget, a future budget. I uh, sure, Member Perry. The 11.4 for the food pantry programs, do we have a sense of what percentage of the need that will help address? I don't I know, know. Sorry, I know that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> At 435. Yeah. I would have to, we'll have to do some analysis on okay. that front. One of the questions we've had is it targets food pantries, but we know there's other ways to address food insecurity, better use of SNAP, CalFresh. Could some of those resources be used for that purpose? And then the other question that often comes up is when you have that dollar amount, how do you divide it across the districts? Is there some baseline that every college needs in order to provide some resources? How do you also account for FTE? So I would just say those are the types of questions we'll have to answer as we move forward. So if you do, lo looking at this, find that there are other ways that, you know, maybe as effective, if not more effective, you come back to us so that we can include that in our advocacy so that we're advocating for the most effective solution. Absolutely. Member Salazar. Um, coming back to the system support program, Laura, what do you anticipate will be the total order of magnitude of funds recaptured? Um, just a guesstimate. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a total of 125 million that's going to get captured. Uh, there was some programs that were not included as part of that, uh, and those funds will just be able to be used by those existing programs for 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 their own purposes. Yeah. Member Perigo. I'm just uh, just on board Member uh, Perry's comment. Um, I'm wondering if at some point in the near future, if you have this information available, I would love to see a presentation on. What's been going on in the state with equity funds? How have uh, colleges used them? And where are we seeing gains with them? Like, I'm never going to argue, obviously, that feeding students is a bad idea. But I'm also wondering, on top of that, like, have we seen improvements in persistence and retention as equity programs have come to light? And where, if we have any idea, kind of where is the greatest bang for our buck when it comes to helping students where their needs are and what really helps them both you know, from a humanitarian perspective, but also from an instructional perspective, like what's really making a dent. So if at some point we could get a presentation on that, I would be very interested to know how equity funds have sort of made an impact on, on the state, if we could. Okay, sounds good. All right, now our, outs our you may. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. And then we'll get to that. So I just wanted to speak to, um, um, the issues around uh, hunger on our campuses and um, and how that started with only a very few colleges even addressing it in the very beginning. And when they did, um, it was where, where do you store it? Where's the space on campus? And that has evolved to almost, what, 80 or 90 percent of our colleges now having that. And so this is an evolution of really how do you Best serve students, and there's no question in my mind. When we had a, we had a um, a student trustee, who basically gave a presentation to us that basically said, I have to make a decision every day whether or not um, I use my money, whether I walk home or use my money for food. Um, I, I've got less than two dollars in my in my pocket. 
Um, and so on the outside, we see our students as being as thriving. And the reality is um, we could be sitting next to one of our students and not know that they have been hungry for, for two days. The other thing I'd like to mention is that the evolution also includes um, of, of, of colleges and campuses getting, getting food but then not having refrigeration. And so what this, what this money allows them to do is to say, this is going to be a program that we can continue because there's a need. And we're not going to waste food. We're going to figure out how we refrigerate it in a way that we're not wasting that and we're, we're able to make certain that our students get it. Um, it's just, I, I was at Santa Barbara um, uh, a couple of months ago. And um, that particular, the, the students who are there, and we think of, I think of Santa Barbara as a very wealthy county. That is not the, that is not the state of our students there. Housing is, is they, have to, they have to be an hour to an hour and a half away from campuses. They are living six and seven, 10 and 12 to, to an apartment because of the high cost of housing for them. Um, what saves them are programs like EOPS. What saves them are committed faculty who make certain that they get what they need. And programs like this is one of those life-saving, and I really do mean life-saving, um, uh, programs. When we talk about how we, how we what, to what extent we, um, how do we sort of parse or how do we kind of, this, this academic side and then this, this basic need side, they are married. They are absolutely married. We cannot have one without the other. We can have, cannot have successful students who are poor, hungry, and homeless and have high, high level of outcomes that are beneficial to get to them to get, help them get to where they want to go without we marrying the academic with the basic needs. Okay, so I am now going to call um, Rebecca Siebert, um, Joe Weiss, and Sodalia King to the up front. No, oh, you want to pass something out? No, no, he had a comment. Oh, you yeah. had a. Oh, okay. Then um, do you have a? You're you're fine. Are you sure? Okay. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chancellor Oakley. President Epstein, members of the board, Rebecca Silbert from Corrections to College, which as I sit here is an independent nonprofit, but by your next meeting, we are moving the work and the funds into your foundation because it is your college that's doing most of this work. Um, I wanted to extend heartfelt thanks for including the $10 million request for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students. It wasn't in the January budget. That does not mean we will stop trying. Your colleges are doing more than anyone else. You have 25 colleges doing face-to-face -face ADT pathways in our prisons with 6,000 unique students, enrollment over 12,000, 40 colleges with on-campus programs serving well over 1,000 students, including Shasta, doing an amazing job and really leading the state. Um, it, the students are doing better. We're releasing a report this week with Stanford on grades, completion, and success. They're across the board better than their counterparts, counterparts and they're finishing with the only limitation being classroom space. We know it's a priority of the governor. Um, you know, CSU got 3.3 million to serve 340 students on campus. You have thousands. They got 3.5 million ongoing for the BA inside um, for the ADT students that your colleges are pushing out. Um, so it does continue to be a fight and we will keep fighting. And I would uh, invite all of you and any of you as you visit campuses this year to reach out to Laura Mattoon or the chancellor and see if you can visit one of the prison classrooms because I guarantee you, you will walk away changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Epstein and uh, Vice President Haynes and the board, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Joe Wise. I'm superintendent president of Shasta College up in Reading. And I'm also serving this year as the CEO CCC board president for the league. So um, just a few comments. Um, we do have a good starting place with, with the budget. And as uh, board member Costa said, it's May revises when it counts, right? Um, but um, just comments on maybe four or five thoughts here. And um, first, I just want to comment on the uh, amount for deferred maintenance and, schedule and instructional equipment. Um, 
it, it's, uh, at least it's there, but it's not very much, right? Um, so I think of it from a Shasta College perspective, we think of getting about six tenths of a percent based on FTS of, of an amount like that. So that's about $100,000. So maybe we could fix one roof out of, on our uh, campus with that kind of money. So I would uh, suggest advocating for a, a larger um, uh, allocation uh, in that area. Um, I do wanna mention, um, I was hoping for a STRS and PERS investment like last year, so I think that's something that we would benefit all of our uh, colleges and employees um, by uh, getting that, um, those rates to be less uh, effective on our general budgets. Um, I'm very intrigued and I was listening intently to your conversation around the uh, consolidation of the system support program, and so um, I think the CEOs would like more information on that as, as it unfolds to to be able to inform that discussion. And then two last things. Um, I noticed that the um, $4 million for the CCC library services platform was not included. Um, that was in the system request. Um, and I would advocate to try to get that in there as uh, represent, representing a lot of small rural colleges that those services are very uh, helpful to all our colleges, but especially the small rurals, um, not, not having to deal with uh, um, our own contracts and our own agreements for the library services that online services is just a very helpful thing for us. And then um, I would, uh, I liked uh, hearing the, the disappointment uh, and not having uh, more support for the chancellor's office in the initial proposal. Um, as CEOs, we really do uh, feel a need for the chancellor's office to have a little more um, capacity in the data and, and uh, research areas that the uh, student-centered funding formula is requiring of all of us. And so we'd, we'd like to push for more of that. And I'll end there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's me again, <laughs> um, Sadalia King, representing the Faculty Associations of California Community Colleges, also known as FAC. <laughs> um, we're here, I'm here to speak to, uh, or actually commend and thank uh, uh, everyone for the opportunity before through the budget process developing what ultimately became a letter that you sent to the legislatures. And from that, there was some really good proposals that came out of that. And so we just wanna commend everyone on their work on that, all the stakeholders. Um, and, uh, and then therefore the governor recognizing the importance of educator diversity. Um, and we further commend for uh, the governor and then also um, folks here to for acknowledging that supporting educators is critical for ensuring our students' success. Um, and while VAC applauds uh, these proposals for the one-time increase of $15 million for the pilot fellowship program, to, um, to improve faculty diversity and the one-time increase of $10 million for part-time faculty office hours, uh, these proposals should be expanded with increased ongoing funding. This should not be a one-and-done situation. This is something that we hope and we plan on um, working with all of you and other stakeholders to see this through. Um, the uh, government's proposals are an important step in supporting um, full-time faculty hiring, focusing on faculty's <laughs> diversity. Um, however, uh, the long-term results, blah, 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 sorry. <laughs> and the fact it's also grateful for the proposed increase of um, $167.2 million for the cost of living adjustment. Um, the 2.29 increase will provide additional support to our system for the benefit of all of our students. Um, we look forward to working with the administration and with all of you um, and our legislative leaders to improve upon the proposal. And uh, FAC will continue to advocate on behalf of our faculty members for the success of the students in the California Community College system. Thank you. Um, Adam um, Wetzman and Larry Galizio. As they're coming up, are, are there classrooms in, in every prison in the state? Does anybody know? Classrooms? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, but the California Penal Code requires CDCR to prioritize, not, not perhaps unreasonably, to prioritize um, basic literacy. 
and job training. So the state, California state prisons provide CTE internally. So statutorily, the community colleges are allowed to provide anything that does not overlap, duplicate, or supplant, interfering with their, their union members. Um, CECR has 125,000 men and women. 52,000 of them have GEDs or diplomas. You're serving about 6,000. So there's a lot of unmet need. They're waitlisted at every prison. So you, you, you might have just answered it, but the, the community colleges <laughs> have how many students I inside prisons? 6,000. 6,000. You just said that. Okay. And, and can students go to class every day if they want to? It varies prison by prison. Um, most of them do Monday through Friday between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. It's a space issue. It's not a, it, there's wait lists everywhere. It's, it's just CDCR prioritizing their space. So we only have um, one person coming up, Larry Galizio. Thank you, uh, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, members of the board, and Chancellor Oakley, thank you. Just continuing a uh, couple of issues that uh, President Wise didn't have a chance to mention that the CEO board and the trustee board have mentioned as in, in terms of priorities and reactions. And you know, one is I, I would like to think that our collaborative work uh, during Undocumented Student Week has helped facilitate uh, this this investment that we've seen. So I, th I think that's a positive. Uh, the, we're proud of the work. Uh, over the years that the league has done and, and others on dual enrollment and getting an investment in there. I think if you talk to, uh, you know, people in the in your neighborhoods and they've taken advantage of that, that's really been effective and helpful. So we think that is a real positive. Um, total cost of attendance and financial aid, I don't know if reform is a strong enough word, but I. I understand that the governor didn't put money in the budget because we're waiting for that, but I don't think it could be, uh, there, there's nothing I, I think that's more important for whether it's basic needs, I just our students are not, um, we don't invest in our students in that way and provide them the opportunity. So we have to restructure this, this financial aid system that we have and we look forward to continuing that work. That is a high priority of the league and the trustees and the CEOs. Um, our per student funding, base funding, while the COLA is okay, if you look at the pension obligations, the, the desire to hire more full-time faculty and to diversify that faculty, it's hard to do it if you have to, you know, you need a sustainable budget. And so we're gonna continue to hammer base funding and we need more, a better per student funding. I'm glad that the CSUs and the UCs got 5%. The system that educates the largest number of Californians though, needs more a greater investment. One thing I did want to really highlight, though, the last thing I would leave you with, and I would say we are having our legislative conference at the end of this month, and it so happens that the lieutenant governor is one of our keynote speakers, so there's no connection between the topic, uh, the conversation that you had earlier, <laughs> but just as an FYI, and, and as and we're also proud that the, um, the attorney general will also be a keynote speaker, so I hope you're able to make it to the legislative conference, but um, President Wise had mentioned the library services platform, and seconds. it's a really small ask, $4 million, but there's already been an enormous amount of work and there's been an investment to implement. So if you talk to a legislator, $4 million to save probably $5 million so that every single college and every single student has access to the databases and the information that they need to, adv uh, to advance their education. Thank you. Thank you. I think that wraps up uh, day one here. Um, the, uh, we will reconvene tomorrow at 9. Um, looking at the agenda, I think we should be done by noon. And uh, with that, we will uh, meet tomorrow. <laughs>